three people at times, but how do we, uh, oh, you um, can you hear me all right, everyone? All right, so I, first a little bit on me, um, for whatever that matters. I worked at Greenpeace for 13 years. I've been doing environmental work in the science and policy arena for 20 some years. I have a, uh, I have degrees in environmental studies, environmental science, but I'm not a physicist. I'm not anywhere near qualified uh, to build things uh, or to invent things. But this, I met uh, people from Blacklight Power uh, 12, 13 years ago and was brought up here to see something that could change the world. My, my sole interest is climate change. I'm pretty myopic, um, I'll admit it. I only care about this technology because of its environmental benefits. I hope all of you make a lot of money with it, uh, but that's not, my, that's not my role here or my goal. In fact, um, I see a lot of, uh, a lot of your enemies uh, you know, who will not like this to take off. A lot of, there are a lot of interests in the world who don't want alternatives to the way energy is consumed today. So this is just a stimulus, uh, a quick talk on why it's important. Climate change, clearly the biggest challenge we face, a massive puzzle. Uh, the issue is interwoven with every aspect of the economy, um, and society and governments have been extremely slow to react, in part because of industry blockage. That's a lot of what I do. If you look at my website, climateinvestigations.org, and some of the other work I've done, exxonsecrets.org, and uh, Polluter Watch, those are some of the things I did at Greenpeace, identifying the opponents of clean energy, the opponents of change. So we need enormous changes. Why? The indisputable evidence, this is the Mauna Loa uh, Volcano Observatory, carbon dioxide climbing, climbing ever northward, uh, above 400 parts per million now and going farther before we stop it. Uh, followed by the temperature, these are anomalies uh, above the long-term averages for the, uh, for the world. And, you know, this is not good because we're hitting, uh, to, uh, this is 2015 and 2016 is on, on pace to be the warmest year since record keeping began. Uh, the impacts of, of that are extreme weather events who, that are increasingly being tied directly to anthropogenic change. Uh, scientists getting better at saying uh, Hurricane Sandy may have happened, but may have been a little worse, or may have not happened without anthropogenic climate change. Uh, you know, thousand-year storm events hitting different states year after year. And uh, Mayor Bloomberg said after Sandy, when the hundred-year events happen every year, they're no longer hundred of hundred-year events. Um, and we have a lot of data to show that that the record is uh, is changing. Sea level rise is probably the most daunting. Does anybody like to go to the beach? Well, there's not going to be many beaches if we let this thing keep running away. Uh, massive species extinction that depresses my daughters more than anything, I think. Uh, and basic disruption of the economy, agricultural disruption, destabilized governments. There are, there are scientists who have looked at the, uh, the, the link between drought and the Arab Spring and the Syrian migration to the cities linked to the failure of the wheat crop and whether or not all of the mess that we have in the Middle East is in part due to climate change, due to uh, an historic drought that they've had of late. So that's no joke. And here in the U.S., where's all our food come from? In the middle of that brown area that is not a severe drought or an extreme drought, but an exceptional drought. It's not getting better. And in many ways, some geologists are saying you can't call it a drought because a drought is a cycle. This is not going to get better. Um, and you see on the top the progression for over just a few years. Hurricane Sandy costs $65 billion, I think. Um, a mess, there we are just east of here. Uh, an old roller coaster went, in the, went into the sea. Uh, and, you know, bad things happen. And again, how do you fix that? How do you, you now we're starting about starting to talk about the investment in defense mechanisms, in seawalls, and uh, you know, how, to, how to hide from it instead of the, s the solving of it. So, and then locally, you know, how does it affect you? Uh, many more sticky hot days that will be very uncomfortable and kill people, in fact. Um, these are projections from, the, uh, from NOAA for Philadelphia, right down the road. Um, 
We know fossil fuels are the biggest problem, also deforestation and land use. Emissions are growing in, in the countries that are growing rapidly. But we now know we can't burn it all. Um, and there are agreements to reduce emissions to, to hit this so-called two-degree target, to not let global temperatures rise above two degrees. Uh, policymakers have decided that's the stop sign or that's the speed limit. How do we get there? Um, the red line is sort of business as usual. And the lower blue line is a, a, a way forward that would, be, would, would reduce emissions and keep them below you know, between 430 and 480 parts per million. Remember, we're at 400 right now. So really bad things happen at that level. Global temperatures go five degrees north of where they are now, C, and at the poles far worse, and we get polar meltdown. You hear a lot of talk about China <clears throat> being worse than us, but on net, but if you look at the per capita emissions, we are still way ahead of the world in the United States in how much energy we use and how much waste we make. So I just whipped through this. This is just, you know, a lot, just blank your mind. You see a lot of curves going the wrong way, you know, <laughs> growth that is not sustainable. And the carbon bubble, this is a really interesting a team of scientists and economists who have now realized that you have you have a finite atmosphere, and we only have a little bit of space left. The blue circle is sort of the remaining carbon that would, uh, would, we could emit and not blow the bank and keep us below two degrees. Uh, other, as we talked about, as was mentioned earlier, other um, externalities include all of the dirty parts of the energy economy that happen now, ocean acidification, which is the CO2 being directly absorbed into the ocean and making it, uh, un making it too acidic for certain animals to make their own shells, which will disrupt the entire food chain of the ocean. And then air pollution. Here's China. Um, they're investing in clean energy mostly to save people from dying, uh, which is a really important thing as well. Um, and then, you know, the hill we have to climb is steep. You'll hear a lot of talk about energy poverty. Randy mentioned, you know, we need... Um, clearly to raise the standard of living of people who don't have enough. But you'll hear companies, coal companies, use that as well and say coal is the salvation for the world and we need to build a massive grid across Africa with giant nuclear power stations. There's another way, distributed power generation and simplified energy sources uh, like solar, like, like uh, this machine right here. So really, I want you to consider what the, the real value of, of BLP's work is in the carbon constrained world? What is it worth to solve to stem climate change? And uh, that number is hard to imagine. It's worth trillions of dollars to help this problem of climate change not get worse. You know, again, electricity demand rising, GDP rising, energy demand, uh, you know, that, that blank space between uh, the, da the dashed line of energy demand is efficiency. So that's another solution. Along with better sources of energy, we want better uh, you know, efficiency and conservation of energy. Um, those are all from the Exxon Energy Outlook. So uh, I don't agree with Exxon on much, but they're pretty smart people. And they, uh, they, have a good, they have a good beat on where they want energy to go and energy use and other charts. They have oil consumption continuing apace. So massive decarbonization needed. Nuclear is way too expensive. We really it's really ruth uh, stupid to invest more in nuclear power because all of them cost more than they should and uh, the externalities are enormous. Clean coal, we've dumped hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money into clean coal and it really is also not going to work. Natural gas, you now have huge growth and it's one of the biggest competitors to both renewables and any alternative because gas is so cheap because of fracking. Um, solar and wind are growing faster than anybody expected but not fast enough. And then there's the, the dreamscape of better batteries and, again, efficiency and conservation spending. There's no lobbyists for efficiency, by the way, because it's, you, know, you buy better windows and you're done. You don't have a bill every month. Um, there's a simple diagram of where we are, you know, fo uh, similar to one column put up, where fossils and nuclear dominate. Of renewables, you see the, you know, the breakdown there. So this is just food for thought. We have. Um, Growth here, this is the hope. The little blue and yellow on the right are solar and wind, which are growing rapidly. This is global uh, power plant 
uh, construction, and, but still a lot of coal plants being built worldwide, mostly in China. Um, you know, there we are. That's the, dream, that's the Greenpeace, you know, poster. We hope that the world can be charged, can be built around a, a clean energy future that involves uh, massive construction of wind and solar, but it won't happen fast enough is the truth. And in fact, we can't solve climate change fully. We're, we're bracing for what's, ha what's inevitable, and we are hopeful that we can stem off, stem what's, uh, you know, the worst of it. You know, Tesla is uh, annoying to a lot of people, but also changing the world, but they're not going to solve climate change with their batteries and their cars. I was just in Vermont, though, and this is a charging station at a local grocery. You know, they have, they're actually building infrastructure to embed their technology in society. So maybe it's a model, f a model for how to, uh, how to penetrate and be a disruptive technology. They certainly are disruptive for the Exxons of the world, but they're not really uh, going to change the market because, as was said, we still need electricity to put in those batteries. So that's, that's my spiel. I just wanted to kickstart a conversation about the, uh, the enormous benefits of a carbon-free energy source and uh, Godspeed in getting it to market. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, we certainly uh, have that as one of the benefits of